Okay, I think I'm recording. Yeah, okay. That's always good to start a video with, I think I'm recording. Okay, so welcome to uh, lecture two of uh, women in uh, early America. This is uh, women in the North American colonies. This is gonna be split in two parts. So uh, round about when we get to the end of our, uh, of our time today, I'll be stopping it and then we'll pick up with that spot next week. But it's all part of the same overall idea. And this one is focusing uh, particularly on the colonizers, on the European women who come over and are part of uh, creating uh, the, the colonies creating the situation that created the United States, basically. Um, I will also be talking about the uh, women who are brought over here from Africa involuntarily, uh, but that's gonna be next week. That's at the end of the lecture. So. so let's get started here. Now, people have a tendency to think, when people think about the settling of the Americas, particularly the area that became the United States, they tend to think of it starting with the English. Now, we are all taught about Christopher Columbus and we know about Christopher Columbus, but because the English ended up being the, uh, the colonies from which the United States was born, people tend to think of the beginning of American history being with English settlement. But of course, the first Europeans that were on these continents were not English, they were the Spanish. So unlike what the English did, okay, and we'll get to them, of course, uh, unlike what the English did, the Spanish waited until they had some settled communities to bring their women to, okay. Uh, and the French essentially do the same thing. Uh, the English do not. So the first Spanish women that we see in the Americas are uh, accompanying Columbus's third voyage. There's uh, 25 or 30 women who are brought over essentially to be wives to the, uh, the men who are already living there, okay? They're also here, uh, hopefully, to create a more moral society. Uh, and it's also supposed to show that the area is safe, okay? Uh, the French do similarly that when they want to show that the area around Le Detroit is safe, they, uh, uh, they bring over the, the women, and we'll get to that. So uh, there's an interesting dichotomy here, uh, just in terms of culture, because of course, at this point, point culturally women are often uh, seen as evil temptresses and things like that right uh, within the context of of the society and Catholicism and all of that but of course these women are deemed to bring better morals to the the community in, in the colony now really what that means is that the crown is hoping that the men the Spanish men who are colonizing will stop, uh, for lack of a better term, shacking up with locals and producing illegitimate children. So they'll marry these Spanish women and that will make them, uh, those men more respectable, put them in a more respectable position, make the entire uh, colony and the society of it more like what's in Spain. Okay. So by the time we get to the mid 1500s, uh, the Spanish require that people get licenses from the crown offices to emigrate to the Americas. Prior to that, uh, you just had to be registered. Uh, there was a, a, a person who said, okay, you know, these are the people that are in the Americas, write your name down, uh, and you had to be Catholic. Okay. Now, you still had to be Catholic with the registration, of course. You had to be in good standing with the law. You could not emigrate to the Americas if you were a criminal. Now, here's something I have to appreciate. A married Spanish man, if he wanted to travel to the Americas, he had two options, okay? He could take his wife and, and his family with him, okay? Uh, particularly his wife, the family is not a necessity. Uh, or 
if he wanted to go by himself and leave his wife behind, she had to give him written permission that was presented to the people who gave out the licenses. Okay. And that written permission had to be renewed every two or three years, depending on when we're talking about here. Now, the idea behind this is, of course, you have men who are leaving Spain, going to the new world with the idea of simply abandoning their wives, okay? Whether that's what they intend to do or not, that's functionally what happens to a lot of women. Uh, this is also meant, uh, excuse me, this, this is also surprisingly effective, okay? You, you read that, okay, they had to get a written permission from their wives. Well, okay, fine. Uh, you know, how many people did they go after who didn't do this? Well, there's hundreds of records of men being recalled from the colonies because they have not either gotten that written permission renewed or because their wife and family have gotten to a state where uh, they are not able to care for themselves. So he has to come back and assume responsibility for maintaining the family. So that's pretty interesting to me. Now, for, and of course, a single man with, uh, without a wife, without other attachments, all he had to do was get the license. Um, for a woman, uh, a single unaccompanied woman could not get a license unless they registered as a washerwoman, which was a euphemism for a prostitute. So, uh, you know, if a single woman who, let's say, was not concerned about what her respectability might be, she doesn't actually have to be a prostitute, of course, uh, could just go registered that way, but that's gonna follow her into the colony at least for a little while, anybody who knows what the records look like. If a single woman wanted to go to the colonies uh, in a respectable way, then what she would do is find a, a family who was emigrating and would sign up with them as one of their servants. Okay. Uh, it was perfectly respectable to be a servant in that context, okay? We're not talking about enslaved people at, at this point. So uh, that was a way to get over here. And then of course, uh, if a man was going to the colonies and a, a female relative wanted to go along, you know, as long as he was okay with it, of course she could go as well. And that was perfectly respectable, so. Now, once we get to the colonies, okay, with the exception of the fact that you are, uh, dealing with an area that is uh, uh, being colonized, that, that settlements are still being developed, that uh, you have relatively consistent warfare with the natives, that kind of thing. A woman's life is going to be basically the same as it would have been in Spain. The primary role is going to be as a wife and mother, okay? Um, particularly like those women who were sent essentially to be wives, okay, uh, the, it would be a problem if they decided not to marry. Now, of course, that's, that's what the, uh, the idea was, okay, but being a wife and mother in a colony that has only recently been set up is a great deal different than being a wife and mother, say, if, you know, you're living in Seville, right? So, um, being a wife and mother meant having to do a lot of the things uh, for the household that they might have uh, purchased previously or, or hired people to do or that kind of thing, and obviously depending on their, their social status. Now, there was one other option, okay? The Spanish were uh, very, uh, uh, the Spanish sent a lot of Catholic missionaries over to the Americas and uh, some of these were monks and, you know, not just the regular priests, but monks, and they would set up monasteries, okay, and then they would set up convents next door, like there was the setup in Europe often. So a woman who was a nun, uh, it was perfectly fine for her to join a convent in the New World and be alone, quote unquote, alone because of that unmarried. Okay. And it was if uh, a group of nuns, uh, I want to say two or more, uh, were traveling from Europe to the Americas to become uh, members of one of these convents or uh, join their fellows there or to start one of these convents, that was respectable. They didn't have to sign up as washerwomen because they had a very uh, obvious reason to go. 
But something to keep in mind here is that even as these women's roles were primarily as wife and mother, Spanish law, and this is going old world and into the new world, Spanish law gave Spanish women a great deal more power than many of the other European states. Okay? Spanish women could own property in their own name, and they could maintain control over it going into a marriage. Okay? Uh, uh, they would bring in what would be considered a dowry, and then any other property that they're bringing in to the marriage would the husband had to, um, or I should say could with, with his wife's permission, uh, which was usually tacitly understood, but with his wife's permission, he could handle uh, dealing with the property, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it's going to be sold or rented or like, like he couldn't sell it actually. She could, but he couldn't. Uh, it's going to be rented, it's going to be made in the farmland, this, this, that, or the other. Okay. So he could handle the property, but it had to be available to her should the marriage end, okay, in, in his death or in a divorce. And divorce wasn't permitted uh, per se, okay? This is a very Catholic country, of course, within Catholic doctrine, divorce is not permitted. But there was a legal and ecclesiastical separation that existed that did not allow either party to remarry, but did recognize that they were no longer uh, perceiving each other as husband and wife. Okay. And a woman had a right to initiate that separation and keep all of her property in the interim. So that is a better situation than you see in France, somewhat in England. Uh, England, England, the laws change well, the laws don't change, but the function of them change once you get into the Americas. It's a different situation. And women, English women are much more free once they're in the colonies. Whereas this was true of uh, whether a woman was in Spain or in New Spain. And of course, okay, they are participants in the colonization right alongside the men with whom they're living, okay? There's no way that they can't be. A woman who has sufficient means is going to have slaves, okay? Uh, likely at the beginning, they're going to be native slaves, okay? Later on, after uh, the native slaves have been uh, brought to near extinction and they start bringing people over from Africa, then she's going to have slaves of African descent, okay? And uh, as you can see on there, this is seen as a way of civilizing them. So the idea is you're going to enslave the natives and in so doing, you're going to put them in a position where they are forced to learn Catholicism and maybe you force them to be baptized uh, and practice Catholicism. Uh, you're also showing them the quote unquote right way to live. You're showing them the European way to live as opposed to how they were accustomed to living. And there is of course that inference that the European way is better. Uh, there's always that. Women also were involved in the military expeditions, okay? So you have, of course, women who accompany these military expeditions and they are acting, uh, excuse me, they're, they're going along with their husbands who are officers or, or otherwise soldiers, okay? And those women are respectable and they may act as nurses, they may act as, uh, as cooks, laundresses, okay? Particularly for their husband uh, and maybe some of his close fellows, nursing was across the board, you nursed whoever needed it. Um, and then you have camp followers, which is often used as a euphemism for prostitutes, but it wasn't always, okay? Uh, often, you would have uh, women who were camp followers as a means of, of making money, not through prostitution. They would act as uh, uh, cooks or laundresses and be paid for that work by, uh, on an individual basis by the soldiers uh, in, in that particular expedition. And then of course you did have prostitutes as well. And the prostitutes would also act as laundresses and, and all of that when needed because, you know, you, you need to have something else that you're doing for money. Now, a lot of, I get into the more general 
lives of women on a day-to-day -day basis with the French and the English, because I personally know more about that. I've studied that more. And I imagine for the most part, you're dealing with the same thing. Uh, you know, you need to, to be able to put a meal on the table. It's going to be a different type of meal if you're in New Spain than if you're in New France, but functionally the same. So I don't have a lot here on Spanish women in the Americas, but we can call that my uh, Michigan centric bias. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the French. Uh, the French were not looking to colonize. Okay. The Spanish come over, you know, they, they stumble across the continent by accident uh, for all intents and purposes. You know, Columbus was thinking that he was going to be going to China uh, and the Indies. Uh, it's questionable as to whether or not he thought he still was in the Indies by the end of his life, uh, but that's a whole other story. Uh, and it wasn't until his second trip that there was actually thoughts about let's colonize, let's actually settle people here beyond just exploiting the resources and sending them back to Spain. Okay. So then uh, you have the French and the French don't jump in on this right away. Okay. Uh, they wait a few decades and even then uh, they have some issues pushing into uh, uh, North America. The first French expedition was uh, under the command of a man named uh, Pierre de Laudonnière, and he was a Huguenot. He was a French Protestant, and he set up shop a few miles outside of what would become Jacksonville, Florida, where the Spanish were, and the Spanish were doubly offended because, first of all, these people are French, and secondly, they're not Catholic. Okay, so there, there was a little bit of a, there was a minor holy war that went on between the two of them. And then the French said, eh, the hell with this, we're not doing this. Then around 1600, they realized that there is a great deal of money to be made in the fur trade. Okay? And that the fur trade is being conducted considerably farther away uh, from the Spanish territory than other settlements might be set up. So they start, uh, sending people to uh, the new world to look for, uh, uh, to buy furs, to procure furs, and also to look for what was thought of as the Northwest Passage, which of course nobody ever found. The first of these men, or excuse me, the, the most, uh, uh, the earliest and most successful of these men is uh, uh, Champlain, okay. Champlain comes across, of course, he looks for, in the process of looking for that Northwest Passage, he finds uh, the Great Lakes. He didn't discover them. There were a lot of people already living there, but he finds them for himself. And, uh, and that is what prompts greater settlement by the French in uh, uh, what is now Canada and the Northeastern United States and, and Michigan. But even then, you don't have a lot of people going over with the intent of staying. Okay. And the ones who do are far more willing to get involved in local society. Okay. The French fur traders that come over here uh, in small groups or by themselves become uh, a quasi, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. They, they take up a temporary position as being uh, as close to the natives as they can get. Okay. Often they marry into the tribes. Uh, they will fight wars with the tribes. They, they ingratiate themselves in any way possible. Okay. And they're, uh, I just realized that says ingrate instead of ingratiate. Fix that. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and so they, they looked at it more as these are the people who live here and we're going to at least have some respect for the fact that they have lived here for centuries prior to our showing up and, and go from there. Now, do not take that as they didn't commit colonial atrocities because gods know they did, okay? But it didn't, it didn't start out with immediate violence the way that the Spanish conquested and the way that the English conquested. Uh, the, the French fur traders and trappers were known as voyageurs. This is where we get the word voyager, it's French, okay. Um, and of course, because of this, because you have primarily fur traders and trappers coming into New France, there aren't a lot of women. Okay? 
there's a few here and there, but for the most part, women do not start coming into the French colonies until you have Montreal and Quebec and uh, uh, Michelmackinac and Detroit established. Okay. The other thing about the French is that they weren't terribly enthused with the idea of leaving home. Um, you're gonna see a number of quotes here from this book uh, called Wilderness at Dawn. It's by Ted Morgan. Uh, Ted Morgan is, was, is? I'm not sure if he's still alive. Uh, Ted Morgan uh, uh, was a uh, journalist and biographer uh, who was also a studier of history, but not uh, uh, in a, a professional way. Okay. And he wrote this book. This was uh, published in the mid 90s. And it was quite, quite an idea when it was published because he presented this idea of frontiers as opposed to some of the other ways that, that history in the Americas was being interpreted. Um, it's a little outdated now with some of it, but it is the first book of real history that I ever read. And so I tend to always come back to it. Uh, he's got a lot of good points. Now, Ted Morgan is uh, a pen name. This man is actually, oh, and I'm gonna, I, I don't entirely recall what his given name is, uh, but he's, he's a descendant of lower French nobility. So if you were to read this book, okay, and what I did not realize at the time reading, and then the first, I, think I was 13, 12, the first time I read it, was that the reason that he is so adoring of what the French do on the North American continent is because he's French, okay? So just keep that in mind. But uh, as I'm uh, talking about what he has to say, like I say, even with the, uh, the pro-French, uh, let's call it a bias that he has, it's still a lot of good work. So he says this about, uh, quote, the French were stay at homes. They did not have the strong imperial impulse of the Spanish or the, Mer or the mercantile tradition of the English. Quebec was not attractive to farmers because the growing season was a brief 150 days and fruit trees would die when temperatures dropped below zero. In addition, the St. Lawrence was frozen solid for three and a half months and there was dangerous pack ice on the Gulf for another three months. So the colony was cut off from France at least six months a year. So it wasn't the most... Uh, uh, welcoming place, okay? But eventually we see uh, larger settlements. Now, the exception to that lack of enthusiasm are missionaries, okay? Missionaries come in and they are going to convert the natives to Catholicism and they are also going to convert the natives to European lifeways. Always with any of this, you can assume that the Europeans coming in look at the way the natives live and say, nope, that's not right. You should not do that. And this is how you should live. Now, that is less of an issue with the French uh, than it is with the English and somewhat with the Spanish, okay? Uh, but these missionaries are some of the first to be introducing this from the French side. Okay. And again, uh, from Morgan. Quote, through prolonged immersion in tribal society, they learned as much as, if not more than, they taught, gaining a depth of understanding of the Indian that was unique in the colonial experience. The thinly settled French had come upon populated lands requiring a policy of accommodation with the native people. The missionaries became agents of that accommodation, France's ambassadors to the wilderness. Poetic, right? Um, yeah, so if you read about the French missionaries, they were, they were a little more welcoming of native ways. They were a little more understanding of native ways. They would make an effort to reconcile native lifestyle to Catholicism. They would make an effort to say, okay, you have this story of the creation. Here's our story of the creation and here's how they are alike. So this is why our story of the creation is correct and yours is just a, a misunderstanding of it, right? Because it always did have to come back to Catholicism and Frenchness were the correct ways to go. Okay. But they made a point of uh, at least meeting them partway. Okay. And once we do have uh, established settlers uh, in the French New World, uh, they're known as habitants. Uh, again, pretty direct correlation to the word inhabitant. Uh, so there, there's your French for the day. 
Now, as I said, we've got Montreal, we've got Detroit. I mentioned Michel Mackinac. Of course, that is more of a fur trading and military settlement, but you do see some women there. Uh, but really, it's Montreal and Quebec and Detroit that really uh, make it appear sufficiently safe for women uh, to start emigrating. Okay. Now, the man who built Detroit, Antoine de la Motte Cadillac, in 1703 sends for his wife and orders all of his married officers to do the same thing. And he does this even though it's still a very, uh, not a very uh, uh, expanded piece of territory. They have a fort. Uh, they have everything that goes with the fort. And that's about it, as you can see in the, uh, in the drawing there. But the idea was, of course, that if there's women there, it shows the natives that they intend to stay. Okay. They would not bring their wives over. They would not bring their children over if they were only coming to the Americas to, uh, you know, buy some furs and then turn around and go home. So there is a uh, a political message to this, in addition to the idea of just, you know, bringing these people's families back together, which probably wasn't top on the list, but that's what it was. Um, the women being there also uh, gave an impression of. Uh, that improved morality like we see with the Spanish, okay? Again, you have this, this idea that women bring with them uh, religion and morals and, and right ways of life, unless you know they're like Eve and then it's a different story, right? So that happens. You have a number of these women come over. They're not, they're not terribly happy to be here, but they're here. And then more French start coming over in general. And the sex ratio is a bit off. So one of the ways to deal with that is uh, what the government of Louis XIV came up with. And it is to pay for the pa passage of French women to go to Canada to become wives. Okay. Uh, they were known as the filles de roi, the daughters of the king. Most of these women came out of orphanages, okay? They would find young women who had no family, who had no real prospects in the old world and say, all right, we're gonna send you to the new world. You'll be able to find a husband. You can uh, you know, explore this adventure frontier kind of stuff. Uh, but most importantly, uh, you're going to have a chance to have a position in uh, society, even if it's lower society and colonial society, but you'll have that chance. The women were also uh, given 50 livres dowries to make them more attractive for marriage. Uh, you know, ask me what that is in modern dollars and I don't know off the top of my head, but it was pretty decent for the time. And the majority of people in French Canada who can trace their ancestry all the way back to colonization are descendants of these women. Okay. So if you have a family who's lived in Montreal from the beginning, likely uh, along the line, there's, yeah, you've got to feed the law in the family. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Spanish set up monasteries, the French do the same thing, and they also have convents. Uh, there was, there were not as many in, uh, in the French territories, but the, there was one at Montreal, and they ran a girls' school there. This was one of the first uh, times that we see the Europeans saying, send your children to our school. Now I say that the Spanish were doing some of that too. Okay. I'm not going to say with, with absoluteness, that the Spanish did not have these types of schools set up, but the French really made a point of it. Okay. And particularly with, with girls in this case. Yeah. Um, it was usually pretty unsuccessful throughout the entire history of trying to the right, convert the natives by taking their children and educating them in a European life way or an American life way that is, is rarely, if ever, actually successful. Uh, often what you end up with is uh, a native person who has been educated in the ways of uh, white people, for lack of a better term, uh, and tries to function in white society and cannot. And then if they try to go back to their home society, they of course have not been educated in how their tribe lives. And so they aren't 
necessarily welcome there either. So you end up having this group of people who have no home uh, because they were pulled away from their families uh, at a young age and educated separately. So keeping that in mind, right, uh, there is uh, a very interesting story that comes out of one of these that is really exemplary of this, okay. Uh, one of the nuns who wrote some of the history of this, uh, she was called Marie l'Incarnation, Mary of the Incarnation. Uh, she was she was one of the teachers there and a nun, and she dealt with a girl who repeatedly ran away. Okay? She would get out of the school, get off of the convent grounds, uh, and would tear off all of her European-style clothing, trying to run back to her, her native village. Uh, they, the, the way the story goes, they could find, they could basically follow her through the woods because of these pieces of clothing. And so she would go home, and then her father, who had converted to Catholicism but was not living in the French settlement, would deliver her back to the, the convent. And this is where you need to be educated because this is uh, what my belief is now, and this is what your beliefs are going to be now. And this happens four times, okay? And then she runs away a fifth time. And the fifth time, uh, the father brings her back and uh, she is found prostrated and in tears in front of the altar in their church. And she's trying to say the Our Father in her own language, okay? which of course was not what they taught them because they needed to speak French in this context. So when you read about this, Marie l'Incarnation says that it is a sign from God that this girl had been converted. Finally, her heart had been turned to Jesus and, and all of that. Um, I don't read it that way. I read it that she was finally broken um, and she'd given up trying to be part of her own culture. Uh, you know, I, I, there's no way to say for sure because uh, we don't have anything from this girl, but it's, it's a sad story uh, and it is very exemplary of what was done to the natives in this, uh, on this continent, in this country uh, for centuries. So uh, just as with the Spanish, once they're settled, the French women's lives are essentially the same as they are in Europe. They're responsible for being wives and mothers, okay? Uh, they have the upkeep of the home, bearing and raising children, of course, cooking, weaving, sewing clothes, et cetera, okay? Um, in this case, you're going to be dealing with some weaving from scratch because not being, not having the uh, things accessible to them that were in the old world, they can't just buy cloth. Keeping in mind, of course, that cloth is still requiring manual weaving at this point. We're not quite when uh, uh, we're going to be able to buy uh, cheaper factory made cloth. And the French maintained control over Canada until the end of the Seven Years' War, what's known as the French and Indian War in, uh, in, in North America. Some of the, uh, the French returned to France after the, the land was given over to the English. Some of them stayed. Uh, they were given, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were given allowances to maintain uh, property under English rule uh, and, and maintain some of their French ways of doing things, even though the English were in charge. So that brings us to the English. Yeah. Now, the English are a completely different animal when it comes to this, okay? The, the Spanish come over with the intent of essentially making money and then they're like, oh, well, I guess we can settle here too. The French come over with the intent of making money and then eventually they come to the idea of settling, okay? The English come over for one of two reasons. There is that perpetual, we can make some money, of course, but you also have a lot of English coming over here because of the religious upheaval in England at the time, okay? You have the dispute between the traditional Anglicans and the Puritans, okay, who think that the Anglicans are too Catholic. And then you have the dispute with the groups who try to break off from the Puritans, uh, who we refer to here as the pilgrims in, in this country, but that name was not what they called themselves. Uh, they, they, uh, that name was given to them in the, a history in the 19th century and it stuck. 
So, so they come over in family groups for the most part. Okay. You do have a lot of single young men who come over, of course. Okay. But from the get go, English ships into the new world had family groups on them. Women were involved from the get go. Okay. Uh, think, you know, Virginia Dare, okay, who was uh, in the lost colony of Roanoke. Okay. That was one of the earliest colonies that the English sent over. And of course, they disappeared. We don't know what happened. So in this early colonial period, women were very valuable, okay? And this is uh, often because of the, un, uh, the uneven sex ratio. Uh, Howard Zinn says this in his, in his People's History of the United States, quote, the conditions under which white settlers came to America created various situations for women. When the first, consist when the first settlements consisted entirely of men, women were imported as sex slaves, child bearers, and companions. Okay. So you have, it's not quite the same situation. Okay. So you either have family groups coming over or you have men coming over and then women coming over with the idea of uh, uh, making their own way maybe marrying one of these men, maybe not. But due to that uneven sex ratio, women were very rarely unmarried. Right? And in fact, those who were widowed often remarried much more quickly than they would have in the old world. This is because, uh, you know, because there are so many more uh, men, uh, excuse me, yeah, so many more men than women, of course, but also, this allowed women to be a lot choosier than they might have been in the old world because they were uh, because they were in a position of, I don't want to go so far as to say power, but a little bit more power than they would have had in the old world over their choice of a husband. They were able to they were able to make different choices. Where in the old world, a woman uh, of a certain means might have only had a couple of options for marriage. In the new world, there's a much wider range, okay? And they can make the marriage that they feel best, uh, best to support them, best suits them, all of that. A lot of the women who come over by themselves to the Americas are indentured servants, okay? Now, an indentured servant is very specifically a person who exchanges time and labor in payment of a debt, okay? Indentured servitude existed before people were using it to get over to the colonies. Uh, it was used uh, to deal with uh, legal debts. It was used as a means to deal with personal debts between people, that kind of thing. And so then it was applied to uh, passage to the Americas as well. What would happen is that a person who was already established in the Americas, okay, or who was going to be heading toward the Americas would pay passage for a certain amount of people. Either they would specifically have people in mind that they would have dealt with that they paid passage for, or if they're in the new world, they might contract with one of the companies bringing people back and forth. They would say, I'll pay you know, the passage for three indentured servants. And then they would be delivered indentured servants who, you know, who the, that company had picked up in England. The passage cost something between four and seven years of service. Okay. So you had to be willing to give up between four and seven years of your life and be in a state of quasi-slavery. It wasn't entirely slavery, okay? But it was, uh, it certainly wasn't freedom. Uh, and you had to be willing to deal with all of the issues around that. And often, uh, uh, often the indentured servants were, uh, depending on what kind of a, a master you had, who had purchased your indenture, you might find that you have four to seven years of service for the passage over. And then they, it was perfectly legal for them to tack on 
more time to say account for your room and board while you were paying off that uh, that passage um, for both men and women there was a potential to die of disease or malnutrition or any of the other things that might kill someone in that day and time okay uh, about a quarter of indentured servants died before their term was up now, at the end of a period of indentured servitude, again, for either men or women, okay, they were supposed to get some land and uh, the things that they needed to start their life in the colony. Uh, sometimes that's arranged to be provided by the person who purchases their indenture. Sometimes it's being provided by the English government or the colonial government locally. Okay. The land was something that was referred to as a head right, okay? The English had this set up where if passage was paid from England to the New World, to the English colonies, you automatically got 50 acres of land. Okay. Keeping in mind, of course, the English, they have maps, but they're not great, okay? Um, they don't know how far their colonies extend. If you ask them, they extend all the way to the other side of the continent, and they don't even know where that is at this point, okay? So they're, they're giving out land for that paid passage. If a person pays the indenture for someone to come over to the new world and that person does not complete their time as an indentured servant, whether they die or run away, okay, or whatever, the person who provided the, uh, the money for the indenture for this person to come over gets that 50 acres. So there was a, let's say, a, a, a kind of cruel reason to make sure that your indentured servants didn't survive, okay? Uh, cruel incentive, incentive, that was the word I was looking for. Or that their time of service was continually extended. Okay? You get to the end of the seven years, well, you owe me, two years for room and board now, okay? And the end of that two years, will you owe me another year for the room and board while you were dealing with the first two years, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, I say it was quasi-slavery because there was recourse, okay? Uh, there was legal recourse for these people if they were uh, uh, illegally treated, okay? They were considered people under English law, unlike the enslaved. Okay. Now, on paper, that's true. In reality, generally not. Okay. It was not terribly unusual for women who, uh, who held an indenture, uh, who were held an indenture, excuse me, to be sexually assaulted by their masters. You see lots of instances of rape. You see a lot of women who fall pregnant during their indenture, even though they are supposed to remain single and childless. Okay. Um, and if they do have a child out of wedlock, they are subject to bastardy laws, okay? even if that child is the result of a rape. Now, there are a few court cases where you, you have women going in front of colonial judges, uh, uh, explaining their maltreatment, explaining uh, that they had been assaulted, and winning, okay? But for the most part, these women just... Uh, that was part of the life, you dealt with it and that was it. And of course, if you fall pregnant during your indenture, there's going to be a period of time where you can't work and you're going to have to make that up at the end. And if you had a very, very cruel master, okay, uh, a child could be hired out uh, at the age of three. What a three-year-old is going to do as a servant, I, I, I can't even imagine, but they could be and they were. Oh, back on the, the uh, 50 acres part. There's one court case of a couple in, it's either Massachusetts or Virginia, I can't remember which one, but they had uh, an unusual number of indentured servants die to the point that the local, uh, the local colonial government looked into it and it turned out that they were buying indentured servants 
uh, and then killing them for basically to get their land. And there were uh, a number of bodies in their basement in a literal sense, uh, not just figurative there. So now at this point, of course, you have a de facto equality between the sexes to some extent, okay, because of the needs of survival. You can't say uh, in a society where you have such an uneven sex ratio that only women are going to do the cooking and the laundering, okay? Men are going to end up having to do that in some cases because there are no women around to do it, okay? Uh, you are also going to have cases, uh, instances where you can't say, oh, you know, uh, uh, only the men are going to do the field work, the farming and the harvesting and, and sowing and all of that because there just aren't enough to go around. So it is a matter of whoever needs to get the work, whatever work needs to be done is done by somebody and the sex uh, of that person is less relevant. Uh, again, from, from Howard Zinn here, he says, sharing the work of building a life in the wilderness with their men, they were often given special respect because they were so badly needed. And when men died, women often took up the men's work as well. All through the first century and more, women on the American frontier seemed close to equality with their men. Now, keep in mind, there, there's a functional point to that, there's a de facto point to that, but the ideology is not changed. Okay? Because despite this, women are still expected to handle all of the housework, okay? By themselves or with their daughter's help or if they have female servants, appropriate, okay? in addition to any other work. Much more often in these circumstances, you find women who have picked up men's work in addition to what they're doing, than you see men picking up what was deemed to be women's work in addition to whatever they were doing. Okay. If there were no women around, a man would do the cooking and, and deal with uh, the other aspects of, of running the household or running the, the, uh, the camp or whatever. You know. I always say laundry, laundry. Uh, uh, mending clothes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but if there was a woman around, it generally all fell to her uh, if that was possible, okay? So that then the men were focused more on uh, the, the conquering of the land, as it were, whether through farming or military action or whatever. Now, housework at this point, it's the obvious cooking, cleaning, caring for children, Etc. Okay. This is also going to include cloth making, just as I mentioned with the French. And that's cloth making from scratch. You're either spinning wool or making thread from flax, weaving. Okay. All of those things before you can even have a piece of cloth to cut to sew to make clothing. Okay. Um, sewing, of course, I've mentioned that production of foodstuffs. Okay. Uh, a colonial wife was responsible to provide in one form or another, all of those foodstuffs that were needed on a regular basis. So uh, if you had access, if you had a cow, if you had access to milk, okay, you would make butter, you would make cheese. Okay? If uh, uh, when, when slaughter time came or when uh, you know, one of the men in the house brought home uh, a, a kill, okay, it was her responsibility to uh, turn <laughs> turn that in, to, to process the animal okay uh for the most part uh making things like sausage making uh, uh various other uh drying the meat or salting the meat that was the other big part okay so then in terms of uh, uh like vegetables plant matter that you might eat you keep a kitchen garden okay uh, so they're responsible for that they're responsible for brewing beer and cider. They're, uh, they're responsible for producing candles and soap. And all of these things are, looking at this from our perspective, it's, uh, let me rephrase that. These things were onerous to be doing all in their own right in that era. Looking at it from our perspective, it seems more so because we think of all of those things as very much separated. But the making of candles and soap went along with the processing of animals because you'd use the fat from those animals to make the candles and the soap and things like that. Uh, 
so, I mean, there's, it, it all fit together, but it still was an immense amount of work and more than a lot of these women were accustomed to do in the old world. Okay. Not uh, women in the old world did not necessarily worry about having to produce candles if they could purchase them. They didn't necessarily produce butter if it's something they could purchase. All that. Gail Collins says this about it uh, in her book. Uh, uh, where'd it go? America's Women: The First Four Hundred Years, and which is a, is a pretty good book. It's a nice overview of uh, women's life beginning with English settlement uh, up to uh, the early 20th century, give or take. She says this about uh, the situation of de facto equality that the more I talk about, it seems less equal. Uh, quote, they didn't develop any new philosophies about the proper role of women in society. They just didn't have the resources to enforce the old rules and most of, that most of them still adhered to in theory. Two, three generations down the line from these earliest colonists, you are going to see those gender roles be solidified. As soon as there is the means to do that, it's done. Now, uh, in terms of legalities, under British common law, a single woman had control over property if she was over the age of 21. Uh, 21 was considered the age of adulthood for a uh, most of Europe and the, uh, the European societies until relatively recently. Uh, but of course she lost that when she married because she ceased to exist as a legal person when she was married and became part of the person that was her husband, again, in terms of legality. So in practice, okay, excuse me, so, so that's legally speaking, but in practice, you have a great deal more property rights that are allowed of women in the colonies than they, they were in England, okay? Um, oftentimes you had spouses who were gone for extended period of time, especially if you have somebody who's traveling back and forth to Europe and their business dealings need to be, uh, need to continue to be conducted even if they're not there. So the wife was trusted to do that assuming there's no other male business partners and all of that. Uh, practicality required that the wife be able to transact business in her husband's absence without the business partner having to worry that the deal would be revoked when the husband returned. Right. So the women in the colonies were a lot more accustomed to handling property, to handling money, uh, to taking care of various and sundry businesses than they would have been in the old world. And of course, in terms of legality, everything's still under the control of their husband. But th that is something that really only came up if in cases where a husband wanted to claim that his wife had acted uh, inappropriately, uh, or he didn't like some business deal that she made and he was going to take, take his own wife to court over it, which happened. Again, from uh, Gail Collins, uh, quote, the dissolution of normal boundaries between women's work and men's allows some women to operate with an independence the nation would not see again until the 20th century. So there is a good deal more power on the part of these women, even if it was not legally reflected. Now, the Puritans who settle here, so we're talking about uh, the, the quote unquote pilgrims that come on the Mayflower, the Puritans who settle and create Boston, a lot of the Massachusetts colony, okay. Puritans were a little bit different in how they conducted their lives than the usual English Anglican uh, settlers, okay. They, they perceived somewhat a more equal relationship between men and women. They still subscribe to the gender roles for sure. Okay, but there was an understanding that husbands are obliged to provide for their wives, and in that way, the wives are uh, obliged to use that provision in a, uh, a a good way. Okay, so they didn't necessarily have straight up equality. Excuse me, they didn't have straight up equality. But what they had was the idea of uh, there are some things that one person does, some things that another person does. And those are equally important, okay? 
Um, under Puritan rules, husbands were obliged, legally speaking, to provide for their family. Now that's not unusual place all throughout Europe once we have that nuclear family idea. But they are also supposed to be affectionate and kind, okay? Uh, much as uh, the Puritans were perfectly accepting of, of corporal punishment, and that did include of wives, uh, if a man was unduly cruel to his wife uh, or abusive of his wife, uh, he could be hauled up and put in the stocks and publicly shamed. Yeah. So there was some, some measure of uh, recourse there for women. Now, affection is a very particular term that's used here by the sources, okay? And that is supposed to include sexual attention, okay? Puritan women expected that their husbands uh, would be sexually attentive to them and not only interested in having sex with them, you know, for the production of children, but also because it's enjoyable and the production of children comes from that. Uh, Puritans, as much as we use the term to indicate people who are very uh, stolid and uh, uh, strict and, and, and unsexual, the Puritans were, were quite sexual <laughs> as long as you were married. Um, they, they were, you know, go forth and be fruitful and multiply, right? The scientific belief, the quote unquote scientific belief at the time was that in order for a woman to become pregnant, she had to achieve an orgasm. Now, this is, this can be seen in a positive light with the Puritans saying that men need to be affectionate to their wives because that infers that there is um, mutually pleasurable sex, shall we say, okay. The downside of that, the bad side of that, is that it was not believed that a woman could uh, become pregnant if she were raped, because if she becomes pregnant, that meant she enjoyed it, and therefore it was no longer a rape. Okay. Unfortunately, that idea still exists in a lot of the, the Western world. Um, ooh, I'm trying to think of the name of that senator who said that uh, women's bodies just shut down unwanted pregnancies from rapes, and I can't think of what his name was, but it was, about, it was within the last 10 years or so, and he really made an ass of himself. Uh, Angus King? Angus King, maybe. But um, uh, so, so in terms of how people thought spouses, how men and women should be together, uh, if they want to produce children, that's a good thing. Otherwise, not a good thing at all, especially for women who are sexually assaulted. Now, at this time, really at, at any time prior to the modern day, it was not unusual for women to have a lot of children and have not all of them reach adulthood, okay? Now, uh, uh, infant mortality was worse in the colonies, of course, uh, for, the, for the most part, okay? There were some places where you had a better, uh, uh, the infant mortality was lower than it was in say big cities in, in Europe where you would have a lot more potential of, of illness spreading, okay? But for the most part, you see a higher infant mortality rate, a higher maternal mortality rate in the new world. Um, in terms of, we tend to think of in this era, the life expectancy as being quite low, okay? Um, you'll hear people say like, uh, I, I use Rome as the example, cause it's that far back, but you'll, you'll hear people say that, oh, the life expectancy in Rome was only like 35 or something like that, which, when you take the average is true, okay? But this is an example of how numbers can be manipulated, right? That includes the infant mortality numbers. So the babies that are dying at a month to three months old are going to skew the numbers of the people who are living into their 80s, right? Generally speaking, um, if, a if an infant could reach their first birthday, they had a 50% chance of reaching their second birthday. If they wrote, reached their second birthday, they had a 50% chance of reaching their uh, fifth birthday. You got to five, you had a 50-50 of getting to 10. If you got to 10, you had a 50-50 of getting to 15, at which point we're talking essentially an adult, okay? 
And then the issue is getting through the most dangerous parts of life uh, that you are going to experience without dying. Okay. For men, that meant not being killed in warfare for the most part. Uh, in the Americas, uh, uh, in the colonies, you can include hunting in that as well, not being killed uh, in hunting accidents. Uh, for women, it was childbirth. So if a woman could get past those childbearing years without dying in childbirth, then she was just as likely to hit 75 as we are in the modern day. Same thing with the men. The men get through the period in their life where they are going to be at war and potentially killed that way then they're just as likely to hit 75. But keep in mind, there's no antibiotics. Uh, there's not a lot of good healthcare for a lot of the day-to-day -day, uh, annoyances of life. This, the diseases that come through uh, like influenza, that kind of thing. So if you think back in your life as to how many times you had to be prescribed an antibiotic, or you had to go undergo even major or minor surgery, or even have something like a tooth removed, okay? In that era, there was a potential that you would die from that. So it wasn't unusual to have a lot of children with the idea that not all of these children are going to reach adulthood and we have to have enough to make sure that, that we have enough for what we need, <laughs> you know, that you have an heir and a spare and maybe a daughter to use in a useful political marriage. Okay. Uh, divorce in the, uh, and I should say, this is under the section of talking about Puritans, but that was true across, across the board. Um, divorce was not permitted in Puritan society, but they, uh, uh, a couple could be separated. Okay? Like I talked about with uh, uh, the French, and or excuse me, the Spanish, um, they were allowed to remove themselves from each other, uh, but they could not remarry. Puritans considered sex outside of marriage a criminal act. Okay. It was a criminal act for both parties. Um, for men, whether they were married or single, the crime was termed fornication. Okay. A married woman who had sex outside of her marriage committed adultery. Now, you'll notice there uh, a married man does not commit adultery. Adultery does not exist for men in this concept. Okay. Fornication was still a, a serious crime, uh, but adultery is kept for uh, people who can get pregnant, I guess you could say. Um, unmarried women, if they had sex outside of marriage, also uh, committed fornication. They were not committing adultery. Now, just despite the fact that premarital sex was criminal, the Puritans were perfectly fine with the immense number of young couples who had a pregnant bride, okay? Um, there's, there's talk of this that is often young couples would, uh, uh, would not bother getting married until it was absolutely necessary, <laughs> which was usually uh, if she got pregnant and it started to show, okay? So you have this understanding of uh, the realities of things, even at the same time, while it is uh, on the books, a, a criminal act. So. Um, now I'm gonna talk about some women who stray outside social boundaries. Um, Mary Dyer is one of them. Women, uh, women in the new world were often, uh, uh, what should I say, had the opportunity to stray from uh, their usual roles more so than women in the old world, okay? And particularly within the Puritan and Quaker uh, um, communities, there were opportunities for women to stray more than there were for, uh, uh, stray from the society more than there were for uh, uh, women in the old world. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause this for just a moment. My phone is ringing off the hook and I want to make sure that that's not an emergency. Uh, so just a moment. If it'll let me. Let 
No, well, okay, I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Not an emergency, just a very uh, adamant caller. Okay, so the first of these women that I like to talk about is a woman named Mary Dyer. Okay, she's a Quaker, and it was illegal for Quakers to preach in Massachusetts. Okay, Massachusetts is primarily uh, an area with Puritans. Okay, Quakers much more egalitarian than Puritans. Okay, Quakers allowed women to preach. Uh, Quakers saw a level of equality uh, between women that, or between men and women that you don't see uh, in, in the Puritan society and the Anglican society. It wasn't total equality by any means, but it was more than you got uh, elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, so she's repeatedly arrested for preaching in Massachusetts. And there we go. Now, as I said earlier, the Quakers sought to reform the Church of England by instituting greater freedom and individuality. Okay? They didn't believe in hierarchy. Okay? Um, they refused to acknowledge uh, uh, authority, okay? uh, except in very, you know, they, they accepted the authority of God and that was about it. Okay? Uh, Morgan explains this about it. Uh, the practice of addressing everyone as the was considered seditious as pronouns were part of the regulated class system. To call one's father or one's king the was an act of egalitarian defiance. Equally radical were the Quaker refusals to remove their hats before a judge, take oaths or swear allegiance to the king, which was seen as civil disobedience. To top it off, they were pacifists and refused to go to war, which was treasonable. So the Quakers were very much they lived what they preached, at least to an extent, okay? Uh, the fact of Quaker pacifism is one of the reasons that Pennsylvania ends up being run by the British crown after the French and Indian War, or excuse me, uh, uh, in the lead up to the French and Indian War. Um, the, this defiance, this underlying defiance of the, uh, the authority figures is part of what creates Pennsylvania because the king, gives this land to the Penn family in order to get the Quakers out of England. It's like, we don't want to deal with you anymore. Go live in the new world. Okay. Unfortunately, once here, you do see a lot of Quakers who lose that ideology of being anti-slavery, of, um, of having that egalitarianness. Uh, but that's, that's for another class. So, uh, uh, again, uh, another quote from, from Gail Collins, quote, uh, Quakers gave women an active role in church affairs, though it was generally limited to the regulation and guidance of other women. But in a time when women were normally denied any chance to speak in public or assume roles of leadership, these were important opportunities. So the idea was that at least in the eyes of God, everyone is considered equal. Okay? Uh, how things are on earth is a different story, but in terms of the religion, in terms of, of practice and, uh, and the ideology, there was equality there. Now, the Quakers were particularly disliked in Massachusetts <laughs> because they had a tendency of uh, convincing Puritans to become Quakers <laughs> because particularly women and people who don't have a lot of power, okay, servants and the like, and so they were constantly being uh, uh, prosecuted for disturbing the peace. Things got so bad in Massachusetts that they actually instituted a death penalty in the colony for preaching Quakers. Okay. So if you were caught preaching as a Quaker in Massachusetts and you were convicted of that, you know, there was the trial and had to have all that, uh, you could be executed for it. Okay. Now, this is not a terribly popular measure in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, people did recognize the idea that, you know, it hadn't been that long previously that they removed themselves from a religiously intolerant society and now they were doing the same thing to other people. So it only passed by one vote in the legislature, but it was regularly enforced once it was there. Okay. Um, 
The Quakers who did this after the law was put into effect, and particularly after a number of people were executed for it, were seen as purposely seeking martyrdom. Yeah. They, uh, the, the Puritans saw them as intentionally putting themselves in a position uh, where they would be killed. Okay. Uh, now, arguably, that is what some of them were doing. Uh, not always, but but some of them. And I'm going to read the story of Mary Dyer as told by Daniel Borston. Um, Daniel Borston has this wonderful trilogy on the social history of the United States called The Americans. It's broken up into the, uh, uh, the colonial experience, the democratic experience, and the national experience. Uh, great books if you, if you feel like reading a thousand pages or something. So he explains Mary Dyer thusly. The story of Mary Dyer, who left her husband in Newport to court danger and defy evil in Boston, demonstrates both the uneasiness of the Puritans in crowning the Quaker martyrs and the persistence of the Quakers in earning that crown. Her story, one of the most impressive in the annals of martyrdom, is worth recounting. Shortly after arriving in Boston in the early fall of 1659, she and her companions, including an 11-year-old girl named Patience Scott, were banished on pain of death. After only a brief stay in Newport, she returned to Boston. Uh, an aside here, Rhode Island existed because uh, it was a place where people in Massachusetts, Puritans in Massachusetts, could kick people out that they uh, didn't feel were practicing properly. So anybody who was religiously different from them, dissenters, uh, would be booted into Rhode Island. And that's why Rhode Island existed, Newport being in Rhode Island. So they're booted into Rhode Island, and then they come back. After only a brief stay in Newport, she returned to Boston. Your end shall be frustrated that think to restrain them you call cursed Quakers from coming among you by anything you can do to them, she explained. Yea, verily, he hath a seed here among you and for whom we have suffered all this while and yet still suffer. So she was tried on October 19th, 1659, along with William Robinson and Marmaduke Stevenson, who had shared her mission. The 11-year-old stayed home, thankfully. The next day, after a sermon cursing them, Governor Endicott pronounced their death sentence. The will of the Lord be done, Mary Dyer replied as the marshal took her away. She stolidly remarked, yea, joyfully, I shall go. A week later, the three Quakers were to be executed. Mary Dyer marched to the gallows between two young men condemned with her, while the drums beat loudly to prevent any words they might preach on the way from being heard by the watching crowd. When an official asked Mrs. Dyer if she did not feel shame at walking publicly between two young men, she answered, it is an hour of the greatest joy I can enjoy in this world. No eye can see, no ear can hear, no tongue can speak, no heart can understand the sweet incomes and refreshings of the spirit of the Lord, which I now enjoy. Still, the Puritan officials tried to deprive her of her martyr's ecstasy. The two men were executed, and Mary Dyer was mounted on the gallows, her arms and legs bound and her face covered with a handkerchief as the final preparation for hanging. Then as if by a sudden decision, she was reprieved from the gallows. This barbarous proceeding as we now know had been planned in advance. During Mary Dyer's trial, the Massachusetts General Court had secretly recorded their judgment that she be banished, but they also provided that she be present at the execution of the others and be prepared as if for her own hanging. Her reprieve was surely due in part to the uneasiness of citizens who still recalled their own suffering in England. Mary Dyer's response to this act of grace was thoroughly in character. She refused to accept the reprieve unless the law itself were repealed, but the determined judges sent her off on horseback in the direction of Rhode Island. If they thought they could be so easily rid of Mary Dyer, they were mistaken. She said, records John Taylor, one of her fellow Quaker missionaries, that she must go and desire the repeal of that wicked law against God's people and offer up her life there. On, the, on May 21st, 1660, less than a year after her banishment from the colony, the irrepressible Mary Dyer returned to Boston and once more heard her sentence of death. But now Governor Endicott insisted it was to be executed. Again, they were pleased for her life. And again, as she stood on the ladder of the gallows, she was offered her life if she would just leave the colony. But this time she was not to be thwarted. Nay, she declared, I cannot. In obedience to the will of the Lord God, I came and in his will, I abide faithful to death. And she was hanged. 
So you can see from that story, and of course, uh, Borston tells it in such a way that uh, uh, there's a little bit of tongue in cheek about she's looking for this martyrdom. Okay. But you can see why the Puritans would have thought that of these people. Okay. That they were willing to put themselves in mortal danger for what the Puritans perceived as no reason, just to cause trouble. Okay. Uh, if you know your early church history, it's very reminiscent of what was said of, of the early preaching Christians in Rome and the Roman territories as well. So that's Mary Dyer. Now, Mary Dyer was uh, associated with a number of different women in Rhode Island, okay, um, who were dissenters. Okay, who were women who tried to step outside of the bounds. Okay. One of the women with whom she was associated uh, was Anne Hutchinson. Okay. And in fact, some of the records indicate that, Anne, uh, that, that Mary Dyer assisted at the birth of one of Anne Hutchinson's children, uh, and that that baby was a demon child or a monster child, uh, probably just a, a deformed infant. Uh, but Later on, that was uh, uh, she was in part blamed for the fact that Anne Hutchinson's child was uh, malformed. So Anne Hutchinson starts out uh, Anne Marbury, and she is the daughter of a minister in England, and that minister believes that women should be educated too. So she got to have tutoring and education right alongside all of her brothers. She marries William Hutchinson in 1612, and he is very supportive of her, okay? There is nothing in the records where uh, there's evidence that he ever tried to stop her from her preaching, that he ever uh, tried to stop her from uh, uh, getting herself in a position where she's going to be arrested for her preaching, any of that, okay? And uh, so they, they start out uh, in England, they live for a while in Lincolnshire, okay? And then in 1634, they move to Boston, okay? Because their minister, the minister of their church, John Cotton, is moving to Boston and, and much of the, uh, the church community goes with him. Collins tells us this, quote, William quickly became a member of the political elite and Anne, who was skilled in the healing arts, became part of the community of women who helped one another at times of childbirth or illness. The conversations over the birthing bed drifted to Anne's religious philosophy that the gift of heaven was freely bestowed by God and attained and was attained by a direct and was attained through a directed relationship with the Almighty. Now, this in itself is not uh, outside of Puritan belief. Okay, uh, if you think back to the Reformation, starting with Martin Luther, one of the, the essential ideas of Protestantism, of the groups who removed themselves from the Catholic Church, was that they did not require a priest as an intercessor, that they should be able to talk to God directly on their own, that they did not have to uh, you know, go to mass, that they did not have to, although they still didn't have services, uh, that they didn't have to, to have this intermediary in the form of a priest, okay? So that, she's fine there, okay? And the fact that she's only talking to women at this point, and additionally, she's talking to women in a very female-centric setting, okay? Men did not wander into the childbirth room, okay, if they could at all help it. And, and so that's an area where she had some authority, okay? And that authority was not something that was getting in the way of uh, men's authority. So as I said here, at first her preaching is considered within the Puritan orthodoxy. And she was not discouraged from helping the women of the community to better understand the faith. When this starts, she is thought of as a, a a way to maintain, to, to increase and maintain the faith of the women in the community, because she is so well-spoken about these beliefs and they are within the Puritan orthodoxy. 
And so the, the leaders of the community, the male leaders of the community uh, look at this and say, all right, well, you know, th there may be some women who aren't getting the message from us, but they're gonna get the message from her. So that's fine. Okay. As long as she's only preaching to women. And you'll forgive me for having the same text in both places. Uh, she says, uh, her explanation of her beliefs that good works were not required to attain salvation was acceptable at first. Now, good works here should be in capitals because that is the way good works were defined in the way that Luther was talking about them in the way that the Catholic church was talking about them a century and a half prior to this. Um, good works are sacraments, uh, attending mass, okay? receiving uh, Eucharist on a regular basis, communion, um, making sure that uh, your, you, your children are baptized and the, you know, all the children around you are baptized. Lutheranism got rid of a lot of those sacraments. They still have, uh, they, they still have baptism. They have the Eucharist, but I don't know if it's considered a sacrament. And I'm gonna stop there because I don't know enough about it to, to say for sure about other parts. But so those, you know, those good works, were uh, uh, considered not needed if you have a personal relationship with God. Right. So that's fine until she started to, to include church attendance with that, okay? Because for the Puritans, church attendance was a very important part of practicing their faith, okay? And that was in part because there is the community aspect that maintains the faith, Okay. It also was in part a means of watchful control over a lot of the, uh, the congregation. If you have somebody who refuses to show up at services repeatedly and, you know, they don't have a good reason, like they're sick or something, uh, then, then that infers that they're plotting something inappropriate or sinful or illegal or whatever. So once that starts happening, this starts undermining the power structure, because if you don't have to go to, to services, you're not going to end up listening to whatever it is that uh, the minister is telling you, okay, which is likely some form of dictating the, uh, the ideologies the, that are going on in the colony and all of that. Okay. Uh, Mary Beth Norton, so, oh, excuse me, uh, Gail Collins says this about it. At some point, Anne shifted from casual conversations among the women in the delivery room to more formal discussions in her home. She soon began to attract what were for the tiny colony enormous crowds of up to 80 people. Most shockingly, some of the listeners were men. As soon as she started to have men in her audiences who should quote unquote know better, that's when it became a problem. So, the people in charge, including Governor uh, Winthrop, wanted her to stop, okay? So they passed a series of laws outlawing dissent. Now there's already laws against dissent here, but again, just like with dealing with the Quakers, there is a level of uneasiness here because they had been on the wrong end of laws against dissent. So they don't like the idea of punishing their own for it, but it's either that or uh, allow themselves to be undermined. Uh, they then pass a law that uh, without, without exactly saying it, very specifically condemns the type of meetings that Anne was having in her home. Okay. And of course she ignores these things and the people who listen to her, eh, most of them ignore it. Some of them are, are pushed away by it, but for the most part, this is ignored. And so she's brought into court, okay? And so in November of 1637, and in March of the next year, okay, uh, she's held into court on charges of disturbing the peace. And she defends herself. She, uh, she does not hire a, a lawyer or have her husband defend her or one of the men in her group. She does it for herself. And she is able to match the judge and the governor and anyone who questions her Bible verse for Bible verse for Bible verse, uh, when they say, this says that you should not be doing this. She matches it with, this one says that I should, or I can, okay. 
So every time they were trying to convince uh, the the audience that I don't know if there was a jury or not, but it was a public uh, trial. Uh, yeah, trial. Um, every time they were using scripture to convince of guilt, that uh, she found a way to turn it around and make it look like they were uh, un unduly punishing her for doing what is dictated by the scripture. Okay. She's admonished by the admonished by the reverend. Okay, and the quote here is from Mary Beth Norton's Founding Mothers and Fathers, which is an excellent book. Quote, you have stepped out of your place and you have rather been a husband than a wife and a preacher than a hearer and a magistrate than a subject. Okay, so that right there is very much indicative of what they thought about her, her position, what they were concerned about with her. Okay. And eventually, seeing that she would not stop, they banish her. And so she moves to Rhode Island. Okay. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, she, she birthed this demon child in Massachusetts. Uh, she did have other children who were perfectly healthy. You know, a, a birth defect is not a terribly uncommon thing. And, and certainly in an age, uh, an age before, uh, you know, all of the, the neonatal care that we have, you, these things are going to happen. Uh, assuming this even was true, that she did this and this wasn't just an unsubstantiated rumor. But this goes through the Massachusetts population. Well, no, of course, that, that means she really was a heretic and, and all of these, uh, these issues that are going to be used to discredit her. Um, after her husband died, her, she and her children moved uh, to New York in 16, uh, 1642, excuse me, and they're killed in a, an attack by the Sanawe tribe in the next year. They, uh, uh, it wasn't anything to do with her or her preaching. Uh, they attacked the settlement and killed many, many of the people, not just, uh, not just her and her family. Um, all right, the next section I have here is the Salem witch trials, and I don't want to end in the middle of that. So it's a little bit early, but I'm gonna pause it here. We can discuss if there's any questions or anything, and then we'll pick up with the Salem witch trials and the lead in uh, with the Salem witch trials and uh, the experiences of enslaved women in the Americas, and then the lead in to the revolution next week. So I'm gonna stop the recording. Those of you who are listening to the recording, thank you for listening.